Hello, we, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Use of Surface Plasma on Resonance for Probing Cell Matrix Interactions. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Reichert Technologies, Reichert Technologies Life Sciences boasts a rich legacy in optics and refractometry spanning nearly 140 years. Continually centered on generating new ideas and technologies, their purpose is to keep providing the leading innovations that empower you in your ceaseless quest for discovery. Reichert is a unit of Amatech Incorporated, a leading global manufacturer of electronic instruments and electromechanical devices. To learn more, visit www.reichertspr.com. Okay, let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speaker, research assistant, Michael Hill. Michael earned a bachelor's of science in biomedical engineering at the University at Buffalo in 2012. He is now in his fourth and final year pursuing a PhD in the biomedical engineering, in biomedical engineering at the University at Buffalo under advisor Debjan Sarkar, PhD in the laboratory of biomaterials and regenerative therapeutics. Michael Hill will now begin his presentation. Hello, and thank you for joining me for today's webinar. On behalf of Reichert Technologies, I'm presenting the use of surface plasmon resonance, SPR, for probing cell matrix interactions. We'll begin with a brief introduction and a discussion of our motivation in these studies, followed by part one, the characterization of the surface energy of immobilized proteins using liquid contact angle studies, Part two, the test of SPR for a nonspecific adhesion application using endothelial cells. And part three, a test of SPR for a specific adhesion application using white blood cells. Following will be our summary and concluding remarks. Surface forces are central aspects to cell adhesion. There are several classes of surface forces which may be present or absent depending on the nature of the solvent and the material in contact with the biological substance. To begin with are the van der Waals forces which are the long range nonspecific forces which exist between all atoms and molecules. The van der Waals forces consist of the dispersive force which is the interaction between two spontaneously induced dipoles and is quantum mechanical in nature. The Keesum force, which is the classical force between two permanent dipoles, and the Debye force, which is between a dipole and a non-dipole, and is therefore the dipole-induced dipole force. The second class of surface forces I'd like to discuss are the electric double layer forces. Electric double layer forces always exist in solution due to the contact potential difference between a material and a solvent. They consist of a short range and very strong entropic or electrostatic repulsion. And under physiological salt conditions, they fall off after about 10 angstrom separation between material surfaces. The last class of surface forces I'd like to discuss are the Lewis acid Lewis base interactions, also known as electron acceptor electron donor interactions. In particular, hydrogen bonding falls into this class. Hydrogen bonds are very short range, very strong and directional forces which are semi-quantum mechanical in nature. They typically fall off after about three angstroms separation between material surfaces in solution. They can be either attractive or repulsive. Lastly, I'd like to note that in situations of practical interest, proteins will arrive at and absorb on surfaces prior to cells arriving and they will present their own surface fields. 
Therefore, it would be the net sum interaction between all three phases of material, protein phase, and cell phase that determines the net bioadhesive outcomes. Next, I'd like to discuss the difference between specific and nonspecific forces in relation to biological adhesion. In the last slide, we discussed the nonspecific forces. Specific forces are merely a particular pattern or arrangement of the short-ranged hydrogen bonding or electrostatic forces. As discussed, they fall off after about one nanometer under physiological salt conditions. Paradoxically then, they can also be defined by their ability to transmit their effects across thick albumin blankets, whereas the nonspecific forces are screened out or shielded by albumin blankets. One example of a system which is thought to be a specific adhesion system is the arginyl glycyl aspartic acid peptide, also known as the RGD peptide. This peptide is found in serum proteins such as fibronectin, which are known to be cell adhesion molecules. It binds specifically with certain domains of a family of protein called the integrins, which are cell membrane proteins known to be involved in cell adhesion. The very strong bond is likely formed due to the specific arrangement of the polar, apolar, and polar amino acids in the RGD peptide. Another example, which is more well-known, are receptor ligand interactions, which are well-known to be a lock and key type mechanism, which is similar to an anti antigen slash antibody type adhesion. Therefore, we wanted to determine whether SPR could be used to probe both kinds of interactions using vascular biology systems. So first we have to answer what is surface plasmon resonance? An evanescent wave is set up by shining light with the resonant frequency of the surface plasmon of a thin gold film. Since this wave is a near field effect, which is traveling parallel to the surface rather than perpendicular to it, molecules which are in the close vicinity of the surface or actually adsorbed on the surface will change the local refractive index and this changing signal can be measured by the SPR instrument. The range of the signal to sense changing refractive index is a few hundred nanometers from the surface of the chip. In these studies, we used a Reichert SR7500 DC model. The advantage to this instrument is that it has a modular tubing and flow chamber system, which is easy to change. The modular tubing is important due to using cells which have a variety of sizes and also higher concentration cell solutions may cause aggregation and clog tubing. Therefore, a larger tubing can be used if you are using a larger cell size and the flow chamber can also be switched out easily if it is getting clogged. There's a wide possible range of flow rates with this instrument from a few microliters per minute to a few mils per minute. We also used a Riker SPR Gold chip that has a 10% carboxylic acid, 90% polyethylene glycol terminated self-assembled monolayer coupled to the gold sensor chip. <clears throat> this allows us to use EDC NHS chemistry to amine couple proteins to the surface via reaction with the carboxylic acid. In the lower right hand side is a sensogram where part A we flush EDC NHS over the chip to activate it. In part B, we flush 80 micrograms per mil of a protein solution over to amine couple the protein to the surface. And in part C, we quench the reaction with ethanolamine. As can be seen, the signal afterwards is higher than the signal beforehand due to the higher refractive index of the protein at the interface. The controlled shear and real-time signal of SPR offer potential major advantages to cell adhesion studies. Past studies have used several different methods to test for cell adhesion to material or protein surfaces. The first method I'd like to discuss is passive attachment with manual counting. In this method, cells are allowed to attach to a material surface under quiescent conditions where gravity is the only force operative. The cells are left for a predetermined amount of time such as 24 or 48 hours when the material is typically removed from culture and the cells are fixed and stained. From there, bright field or fluorescent microscopy, microscopy can be used to manually count the cells. The advantage to this method is that it is low cost and is relatively easy to do. However, it is very low resolution in terms of the strength of the adhesive bond between cell and protein or cell and material. 
since there is no challenge to the adhesive bond, both loosely attached and irreversibly bound cells will remain on the surface and will be counted. It also does not mimic any natural situation in that some challenge to the adhesive bond will usually be present, such as a shear force. Therefore, cell attachment under defined shear has also been used. A viscometer or some type of flow chamber with a defined shear profile can be used to apply the force to the cells. <clears throat> the advantage to this method is that is, it is not that much more expensive than passive attachment and that you can also challenge the adhesive bond and get a quantitative measure of the strength of cell adhesion. However, we say that it is low resolution because the material is also removed from culture at some point in time and the cells are simply counted to get an estimate of the adhesion strength. Therefore, there is no real time signal on a short time scale of these interactions occurring. The other method which has been used is atomic force microscopy. In brief, a single cell has to be attached to the needle tip of an atomic force microscope. The cell is then brought within the close vicinity of a material surface and the strength of the interaction with distance can be measured due to the bending cantilever of the AFM tip. <clears throat> the cell can then be allowed to remain in contact with a material surface for different amounts of time and the pull-off strength can also be measured. The advantage to this is that it's obviously very high resolution in terms of the spatial and kinetic aspects of these interactions. However, atomic force microscopy is expensive and this method is technically challenging and takes a long time. Therefore, surface plasmon resonance offers several advantages over previous methods, including that the cost and complexity isn't that much higher, you can challenge the cell adhesive bond, and you have higher resolution with a real-time signal, which can give you a signal every 0.5 seconds of the interaction. In part one, we estimated the surface energy of three different immobilized proteins on the SPR gold chip to use SPR for a nonspecific cell adhesion application. In vivo, endothelial cells come into contact with two classes of extracellular matrix proteins. The first is their own secreted basement membrane, which consists of mainly collagen-4 and laminin, but also some sulfated glycoproteins. The second type of tissue they come into contact with is stromal tissue, also known as connective tissue, which is the structural component of tissues and consists mainly of collagen-1 and 3. Endothelial cells are typically separated from the stromal tissue by their own secreted basement membranes under healthy conditions. However, under pathological conditions, when either injury occurs or the basement membrane can be thin due to a cyclical challenge, and the cells begin to contact the stromal tissue. This induces increased spreading and proliferation of the endothelial cells, and they begin to invade the stromal tissue, forming new blood vessels, the process known as angiogenesis. Therefore, the question that we seek to answer is, why do the cells begin angiogenesis when they contact the stromal tissue? And why does the basement membrane act as an effective barrier to this process? The general physics of this is not well understood. Therefore, we used collagen-1 as a model stromal protein, we used matrigel as a model basement membrane protein, and we used serum as a control protein. All three were immobilized onto the SPR gold chips using the EDC NHS chemistry. After immobilization, the chips were washed with deionized water and allowed to dry. Afterwards, contact angle measurements of a variety of diagnostic liquids were measured to estimate the biosurface energy using a RAIM heart contact angle goniometer. In brief, several polar and apolar diagnostic liquid Cecil drops are placed onto the dried protein surface using a flamed platinum wire to maintain the ultra pure state of the diagnostic liquids. An average of six measurements is obtained for each liquid. The contact angle for each liquid can then be used to relate to the surface energy via Young's equation, which is shown on the slide. Gamma SV represents the solid vapor surface energy, while gamma SL represents the solid liquid surface energy, and gamma LV represents the liquid vapor surface energy, where pi is the spreading pressure of the adsorbed vapor on the biomaterial surface, 
which in the case of high energy surfaces artificially masks the high energy surface. There have been several different surface energy theories which are based on Young's equation and relate the contact angle to the surface energy of a biomaterial. The first we'd like to examine is Zisman's critical surface tension. In order to obtain Zisman's critical surface tension of a biomaterial, a series of diagnostic liquids contact angles are measured with decreasing surface tension. When a liquid which is completely spreading is found, its surface tension approximates the critical surface tension of the biomaterial surface. The Zisman plot is obtained by plotting the cosine of the contact angle on the y-axis and the surface tension of the liquids on the x-axis. A linear regression is then performed to the point of cosine theta equal to 1, which gives the critical surface tension of the biomaterial surface. Any diagnostic liquid which is placed on this biomaterial surface with surface tension less than the critical surface tension of the material will be completely spreading with contact angle equal to 0. Below the Zisman plot is the Beyer curve. The Beyer curve purports to relate the critical surface tension of a biomaterial to the degree of biological adhesion and retention under shear. Materials which have critical surface tension in the 20 to 39 per centimeter range are in the bioadhesive minimum and will, will retain little biological substance under shear. Materials with critical su surface tension outside of this range will have a higher potential for biological adhesion and retention of biological substance under a shearing challenge. The physics of a spreading cell on a biomaterial surface can be approximated by the physics of a spreading Cecil drop on a biomaterial surface as pictured in the upper right hand corner. For instance, on low energy surfaces such as silicone, which have critical surface tension of approximately 25 dynes per centimeter and is squarely in the bioadhesive minimum, a polar diagnostic liquid placed on the surface of silicone will remain rounded. Additionally, a cell solution placed on silicone, the cells will also remain rounded with a high contact angle. Moving outside of the bioadhesive minimum to the left-hand side where we have our lowest energy surfaces, which are mainly fluorinated surfaces such as Teflon, cells will also remain rounded on Teflon in the absence of serum. However, the Beyer curve only purports to relate to the actual physiological situation in terms of salt and protein content. Therefore, in the presence of physiological amounts of serum and salt, the cells will adhere tenaciously and spread on Teflon surfaces. The next theory we'd like to, be, to examine is Cowley's method, also known as the method of Owens and Wen. This theory purports to split the surface energy of materials into two distinct components, the polar and the dispersive component. Either component may be present or absent at a given liquid-solid interface. The polar component consists of the Keesum and Debye forces. According to this theory, materials which are dispersive force dominated proteins will not absorb and cells will remain rounded. On surfaces which have Keesum and Debye forces present, proteins will absorb and cells will begin to spread on the material surface. Like Sisman's critical surface tension, Cowley's method uses multiple liquids and the equation is solved numerous times for each possible liquid pair. The arithmetic average for each component is taken and liquid pairs which gave a value outside of the standard deviation are rejected and the calculation is repeated until all values lie within the standard deviation. The next surface energy theory that we examined is the most modern update to surface energy theory, Van Osgood Chaudhary theory, also abbreviated as VOGCT. According to this theory, the Keesum, the Debye, and the dispersive forces are all lumped together into one component, the Lifshitz van der Waals component, which is the apolar component of the surface tension. The so-called polar component in this theory is the Lewis acid-Lewis base interactions, which as discussed includes hydrogen bonding. According to this theory, two electron donating surfaces will repel one another, whereas an electron accepting surface can adhere to an electron donating surface. There are ways of using multiple liquids for these calculations. However, what is most widely used is two polar and one apolar liquid, which is out of simplicity, and three simultaneous linear equations are solved to get each component of the solid surface energy.
First, we look at the Zisman's critical surface tension of the three immobilized proteins on the SPR gold chips. In a Zisman plot, when the linear trend line has a more negative slope, it indicates a more apolar surface. Therefore, examining the dotted line, which represents Matrigel, we can see that Matrigel was the most apolar protein surface, followed by serum, and collagen-1 was the most polar protein surface. We next examined Cowley's method by looking at the ratio of the polar to the dispersive component as a measure of the polarity. It was seen that collagen-1 had the highest ratio and therefore was the most polar protein surface, followed by serum, and matrigel was the most apolar protein surface. This agreed exactly with the predictions of the Zisman plot. Finally, we looked at what the character of that polarity might be by examining the type of hydrogen bonding present on each protein film. We looked at the ratio of the Lewis acid to the Lewis base character as a measure of Lewis acidity. Collagen-1 was the most acidic protein surface, followed by serum, and matrigel was the most monopolar basic protein surface. We next wanted to examine whether the increased polarity and or Lewis acidity of the collagen-1 correlated with increased interaction with cells. <clears throat> we first activated the chip using EDC NHS as shown, and then we immobilized each protein solution at 80 micrograms per mil as shown on the left-hand inset. <clears throat> as can be seen by the dotted line which represents matrigel, matrigel immobilized about four times more protein than the other two protein solutions which were similar. We didn't look for a reason for this, but it is likely simply due to the different solution state conformations of proteins in each of these solutions. <clears throat> We next flushed a cell solution of 10 to the 7 cells per mil over each protein surface at a shear flow of about 5 microliters per minute, which corresponded to a peak shear stress of about 0 0.01 dynes per centimeter squared. As can be seen, the signal for collagen 1 increased very rapidly, represented by the dashed line, whereas matrigel hardly increased all, represented by the dotted line. Matrigel actually increased a total of only 400 micro RIU units. We allowed the cell solution to flow over each protein surface for 50 minutes, upon which time we reintroduced buffer and we reduced the flow rate by half and allowed the cells to interact and spread on the surfaces for three hours. As can be seen, when the flow rate was reduced, there was a sudden spike in the signal for, a coll for collagen 1, but especially for serum. Due to the reduced shear challenge, the cells began to interact more fully with the protein surfaces. After three hours of spreading, we removed the gold chip from the instrument and cultured it overnight in endothelial cell medium at 5% CO2. We then fixed and stained the cells with DAPI and phalloidin. DAPI is a nucleus staining molecule which should cause the cell nucleus to fluoresce a blue color. Phalloidin is an actin cytoskeleton staining molecule which should cause the actin cytoskeleton to fluoresce a red color. These studies revealed that on each protein surface, a monolayer density of endothelial cells was present after culturing overnight. Therefore, we concluded that the very different SPR signals must have been due to differences not in the number of attached cells on each protein surface, but due to the differential kinetics of spreading on each protein surface. Therefore, we use surface energy measurements of protein films to predict the optimal conditions for formation of a confluent live endothelial cell monolayer. In particular, the more polar proteins that had higher Lewis acid character will form monolayers more efficiently. Monolayer formation will be important in SPR studies where you use specific drugs or hyperosmolar or hypoosmolar conditions to test the response of cells. We also found that cell binding was most efficient when the extracellular matrix proteins were immobilized at around pH of 7. Not shown are studies where we tried to optimize the EDC NHS amine coupling of proteins by using proteins in a reduced pH solution. These cause very few cells to adhere due to the unphysiological denaturation of the proteins at the lower pH.
Next, we used SPR to test the adhesive interaction of endothelial cells to these three different protein surfaces that have differential surface energy characteristics. We used hyperosmolar shock studies to challenge the adhesive bond between the cells and the protein films. Briefly, as before, we activated the chips with EDC NHS and we immobilized each protein at 80 micrograms per ml. We then flushed 10 to the 7 cells per ml on the surfaces again and allowed the cell suspension to flow for 50 minutes while cells attached. We then allowed cells to spread for three hours before these studies. The blue arrow represents the introduction of a 100 millimolar hyperosmolar mannitol solution and the red arrow represents the introduction of an isotonic heaps buffer. As can be seen by looking at the dashed line, which represents collagen 1, there is an initial spike in the signal, which is only a bulk shift due to the different refractive index of the hyperosmolar solution. The signal then clearly decreases over 20 minutes before an isotonic heaps buffer is reintroduced and the signal begins to recover. This effect was beautifully reproducible in the case of collagen 1. However, with matrigel in serum, after the first cycle, there was hardly any effect on the second and third cycles. In particular, looking at the first cycle, we measured that collagen 1 signal decreased approximately four times more than matrigel in serum. After three hyperosmolar shock studies, we again fixed and stained the cells as before with DAPI and phalloidin. We then used fluorescence microscopy to image the gold chips in the center where the signal is actually measured and the peak shear stress will be highest. We found that on the collagen 1 surfaces, a monolayer density of cells was still present, but they had a shrunken and crenated appearance with re retracted cell membranes. When we examined the matrigel gold chips in the center of the channel, we found that there were no cells attached, so we instead imaged at the entrance of the chamber. We found that the monolayer had holes in it and that the cells were even more shrunken and crenated than on collagen 1. For serum, when we examined the chip in the center, we found that cells were still attached, but they seemed to be completely rounded, with very few cells being still completely spread. These studies confirmed that the interaction of endothelial cells was highest with collagen 1 and lowest on the matrigel protein films. Therefore, the higher polarity and Lewis acidity of the collagen 1 films may have correlated with the increased cell adhesion of endothelial, of endothelial cells. This is the condition in, evo, in vivo as endothelial cells begin to undergo angiogenesis due to contacting the stromal tissue. We hypothesize that this could be due to these immobilized arrays of alternating Lewis acid and Lewis base groups for collagen 1. However, for matrigel, it is well known to have a cross-link structure, which may shield the Lewis acid groups of the proteins in the matrigel solution. Therefore, the Lewis acid groups could be internally quenched and unavailable at the surface to interact with diagnostic liquids or endothelial cells approaching the matrigel surface. We also used a simple equation that has been used in the past to relate the hyperosmolar shock effect to the Young's modulus of adhesion to the cells on matrigel and collagen 1. Briefly, all you have to do is measure the diameter of the cells beforehand and after hyperosmolar shock and relate this to the concentration of the hyperosmolar solution. We found that for matrigel, the estimated Young's modulus of adhesion was 0.5 megapascals, and for collagen 1, it was approximately 2 megapascals. So collagen 1 had a four times higher interaction. If, as you remember, collagen 1 SPR signal also decreased four times more than that of matrigel, likely due to the cells being four times more spread at that time point. These results also correlate well with previous AFM studies that measured the Young's modulus of adhesion of cells to various proteins and found that they were on the order of a few megapascals in strength. In part three, we wanted to see if SPR could also be used to test a specific interaction between cells and a protein, which will occur across multiple protein interlayers, being the thick blankets of albumin. We wanted to use another vascular biology system of interest, being the interaction between the protein P-selectin and the white blood cell line HL60. 
In vivo, white blood cells are recruited to specific tissue sites upon injury or inflammation. The way that this is done is that the endothelial cells which line those blood vessels begin to express different proteins than a healthy tissue's blood vessels. In particular, the family of proteins known as the selectins become expressed during situations of inflammation. Upon cytokine or other inflammatory molecules signaling, the P-selectin protein, which is typically stored in the cytoplasm of endothelial cells, is released to the cell membrane and expressed into the blood flow. From there, the P-selectin protein can tether the white blood cells and allow them to begin to roll across the endothelium and interact more and more with other adhesive proteins. When the interaction is strong enough, the white blood cell can transmigrate the endothelium and proceed through the connective tissue to the site of inflammation or injury. In our first study, we wanted to differentiate between the nonspecific aspects of HL60 adhesion and the specific aspects. Therefore, EDC-NHS was used to activate both the left and right channels of the instrument, and a human goat antibody, IgG, was covalently immobilized in both the left and right channels. After quenching the reaction with ethanolamine, P-selectin was allowed to bind in the left channel only. On the right-hand side, you can see the changing signal as 10 to the 7th HL60 cells per ml are flowed over each surface. As you can see, the increase in the blank well is greater than that for the P-selectin. We hypothesize that this is due to the longer range of the nonspecific forces compared to the very strong but short range interaction between PCL and HL60 under shear. In this situation, we were flowing the cells at 50 microliters per minute with a shear stress of approximately 0.1 dynes per centimeter squared. Therefore, in our next study, we used bovine serum albumin blocking in order to see if SPR could still measure the cell signal when only the specific interactions were being probed. In these studies, we activated the left channel with EDC-NHS, followed by covalently immobilizing the antibody. After quenching with ethanolamine, P-selectin was allowed to bind only on the left channel, and both channels were then blocked with BSA, which should leave a thick albumin blanket on both surfaces. 10 to the 7th HL60 per ml were again flowed over both surfaces. On the right-hand inset, examining the dashed line, which is a difference curve between the left and right channel, so the subtracted curve left minus right, we now see an increase in this difference curve, which means that more cells were now going onto the P-select encoded surface than the blank well due to the screening of the nonspecific forces of the SPR chip. We then just wanted to confirm the specificity of this interaction. We isolated HL60 cells with MAB KPL1 and incubated them for 25 minutes. This should block the cell surface receptors to P-selectin. We then flushed 10 to the 7 cells per mil over each surface again and looked at the difference curve, which now does not increase, indicating that the P-selectin specificity had been isolated in the previous studies. We did one more control experiment seen in the left-hand inset where we immobilized antibody onto both the left and the right channel, and we allowed P-selectin to bind in the left channel, while 19-FC bound in the right channel. 19-FC is an IgG fragment which should have no specific interactions with the HL60 cell membrane receptors. We then BSA blocked both channels, and we allowed 10 to the 7 cells per mil to flow over both channels at the same flow rate of 50 microliters per minute. As can be seen, the P-selectin curve increased much faster than the 19-FC curve. We then allowed for a dissociation step where buffer alone flows over the cells, and we saw that the interaction continued to increase. We then introduced another HL60 solution, and this time it still increased more on P-selectin, but less so due to the presence of cells already occupying adhesion sites on the protein surface. These two control studies were able to confirm that SPR measured the specificity of this interaction across multiple protein interlayers. The significance of this is seen when you look back to the range of the SPR signal, which is a few hundred nanometers. Multiple protein interlayers, each layer can be tens of nanometers in size, and cells are also large colloidal objects from anywhere from 10 to 100 micron, depending on the cell line. 
Therefore, it was important to confirm that SPR can probe both nonspecific interactions and specific interactions, and it can be used to closely monitor, monitor the nature by which cells spread on ligand-bearing substrates at a narrow distance and time scale. This is something that can't be done with standard microscopes. Therefore, overall, we used SPR to probe cell matrix interactions in the context of both a specific and nonspecific cell adhesion system. These two types of adhesion often coexist in a particular biological context, and it's often controversial as to which one is dominant. Therefore, SPR represents a useful tool to further dissect these intermolecular characteristics and differentiate in different model systems between specific and nonspecific effects. The advantage to SPR is the especially increased information at short length and time scales. We also used hyperosmolar shock studies in conjunction with SPR to quantify the strength of the adhesion of cells with proteins. This could represent a cheaper, simpler, easier, and method which can give similar quantitative results to more expensive methods such as atomic force microscopy. In the future, it would be very useful to be able to visualize the cells as they are spreading on an SPR gold chip. This could enable an increased correlation of the SPR signal to the kinetics of cell spreading which here we did only indirectly. Additionally, regeneration of the sensor chip would represent a huge leap forward. However, removing the cells while keeping the immobilized protein intact may not be possible. If you use high shear to remove the cells, this may cause cohesive rupture, leaving fragments of the cell membrane attached to the surface. Cells are typically removed from surfaces using digestive enzymes. However, this would obviously alter the protein film as well. Therefore, a method which could release the entire used up SPR chemistry and renew it in a cheap and simple fashion would also be helpful. Going forward, further model development is also required for cell studies to get kinetic on-off rates of cells. SPR in the past has typically been used to measure the monovalent binding interactions. However, when cells attach to a protein film, they attach at multiple focal adhesion points and each of these interactions is likely to be multivalent in nature. Therefore, more mathematical development as well as further research is required. I would now like to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Michael, for your presentation. So a quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions, simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Michael will answer as many questions as time permits. And our first question is, does the differential kinetics affect the degree of adhesion and by what moiety does it remain constant? Um, sorry, I don't know what you mean by differential kinetics. Could it, could we have some elaboration on that? I'm afraid, um, I'm afraid there are no more specifics. If the person who submitted that question would want to, um, again, you know, in the, in the question box, uh, clarify, uh, that would be that would be great. So we'll hold that question for further clarification. Um, the next one is um, around slide 18. Low pH will also reduce the efficiency of the amide bond formation. How do you differentiate the low pH denaturing and the reduced chemical reaction? We found that any time we immobilize the proteins using low pH more protein would become immobilized to the surface. Whether this is due to the efficiency of the reaction or whether it is a colloidal stability phenomenon, we're not sure. But what we were sure of is that whenever we would use lower pHs, we would get very little cell adhesion using the same concentrations as when we use physiological pHs. Our interpretation is that the proteins may have been denaturing or they also may have been coupling to the surface in a different fashion 
maybe non-specifically to that reaction. The next one has several parts. So I'll read the whole thing and then let me know if you need me to read anything over. Um, wondering if primary mouse bone marrow cells could be evaluated. Um, with this matrix once attached to a tissue, could, let's see, this matrix once attached to a tissue culture plate, will it begin to differentiate and would it be possible to evaluate the rate of cellular differentiation using SPR changes? I'm not familiar with a specific cell line. Um, I'm trying to understand exactly what the question meant. But if you have a cell which is more differentiated, if it is more spread, then that's something that SPR could measure compared to cells which are more aggregated. Um, in terms of the fine detail of how the cell is attaching to the surface, how many focal adhesion points and how that relates to changing SPR signal, um, there's been a little bit of work done on that, but it's still an open question as far as I know. So the, the first question the first question, uh, does the differential kinetics affect the degree of adhesion and by what, sorry about that. Does the, the first, to the first question, does the differential kinetics affect the degree of adhesion and by what moiety does it remain constant? A um, little clarification on that. He's asking the degree of adhesion in reference to the kinetics. I hope that's helpful. I think I understand the question, although I'm still not positive, but like I mentioned, right as of right now, as far as we know, there are no models that exist to get kinetic on off data of cells. So everything that we did was indirect by trying to see if there were equal numbers of cells immobilized after overnight culture, and it seemed to be the case. So we basically attributed the kinetics of the changing SPR signal to the spreading of the cells. I'm not sure if that answers the question. While we're waiting for more questions to come in, I would like to once again thank Michael Hill for his presentation. Michael, do you have any final comments? Thank you for joining me for this webinar today. Thank you for listening. It was really fun to present this subject to you today and have a good day. Okay, so can I show an example of flowing cells over a protein on a surface? And we have one example of a study where we first immobilize cells on a surface, human embryonic kidney cells and we captured them on the surface and then we flowed a fibrinogen solution over the cell surface and tried to measure the kinetics of the fibrinogen solution um, actually binding to the cells and we were able to get some kinetic on off data but we obviously need to do more studies in the future to confirm this. Okay, uh, I have another question for you, Michael. How does the concentration of protein compare to physiological conditions, and is this important to your results? Sure, that's a very good question, actually. So we are mobilizing these proteins onto a gold SPR chip, and obviously that's not the physiological condition of tissues. Tissues are multiple layers of protein in a macroscopic gel-like state, and they are typically under stress. And the condition of which groups are which groups of the amino acids or the protein backbone are revealed or not revealed isn't certain, as far as I know. So in these studies, we're trying to 
cor just find a correlation which could possibly be related. For instance, if we do matrigel experiments on mobilizing matrigel in many different ways and we find that in all cases we aren't getting access to different polar groups, then we can probably conclude that some cross-linking effect is shielding these polar groups from the surface of the material. Lowering in contact angle measurement is directly proportional to rate of cell adhesion achieved with the SPR method, correct? And that is, that is a question. Sorry. Um, it's a little bit more complicated since these surface energy measurements all come from the contact angle of multiple polar and apolar liquids. If you wanted to just simplify it, I would say yes. However, some of the theories go into more specific aspects such as you can have a surface which you will have a low contact angle because your diagnostic liquid was basic and your surface was acidic but you will have a higher contact angle if your liquid is acidic and your surface is acidic but the surface may still adhere cells more so and this also depends on different cell lines expressing different, am different amounts of acidic and basic groups on their surfaces. Okay, I would like to now end the presentation. Thank you. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed after the presentation. We would also like to thank our sponsor, Reichert Technologies, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through March 20th, 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.